but um, I uh, just stumbled into like Appalachian leftist TikTok after I started making some like catharsis skits after I got fired from the second organization for just being a little too loud mouthed. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> I'm sure you know how that is um and so then like just watching your materials and meeting other Appalachian leftists on TikTok and I was like holy shit I finally have found my people so I was so excited to like be able to actually like interact with you I know it's super exciting and that was that was a really cool thing I love TikTok I know people have a lot of things to say about it it's not a perfect platform but I have found so many like high quality people that are now like part of my life outside of TikTok, you know? I've yep. met people in my own hometown by posting about a strike that was happening local a couple of years ago. And people are like, oh yeah, my husband works there. And like, now we're buddies, so. Oh my gosh, same. I've had people who have been like, oh, that's Silva. Like when I posted like pictures of us like protesting in front of the courthouse and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you know where I am. And they're like, yeah, I'm here. And it's just so, uh, I love, like you're right. No social platform is going to be perfect. There is no ethical consumption under capitalism. But uh, if we're using it like to build power and connection among people who need power and connection, then we're doing a good thing. What And that- Appalachian leftists are hungry for that yeah. because it's not as easy for us to go sit down in Starbucks or if we even have a Starbucks, which my town doesn't, um, no. but it's not easy to go sit in the coffee shop or, you know, you're walking down the street and you see someone with a t-shirt on that kind of gives an idea of what their politics are. Uh, we don't do a lot of that because we're all taught not to, not to rock the boat. You don't want to rock the boat. So we're all very quiet and platforms like TikTok really help us find our people. I love it. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh my gosh. Well, okay. So since I am recording, I guess we should just start from the beginning. Like, who are you? Where are you? Who are you from? All the things. Well, I am in Southwest Virginia, which is um, about 30 minutes from where I grew up. So none of us go very far. Uh, well, some that, of us. Okay, wait, is that Southwest Virginia or is that Southwest Virginia? The first one you said, Southwestern okay, gotcha. <laughs> Virginia. Yeah, cool. I'm in like the, like if you look at Virginia, it's kind of the triangle and then the little doot on the end. I'm I'm somewhere in the doot. Um, gotcha. So and I've always been here in the doot, doing my thing, doing your thing. And yeah. uh, what is your thing? Oh, well, I've had a lot of things. Um, so I'm a mom. I have kids. Um, I babysit. Uh, and I do a lot of things. And that's kind of, I've had a lot of different jobs, most of them in childcare. Um, but all of the activism I do and that kind of thing, that is all secondary to everything I thought my life would be. Like it wasn't the plan. I have no formal education in any of this. Um, I have half of two degrees from the local community college, uh, yes. <laughs> which I will finish at some point, probably. Um, I, right. There's no rush. I got halfway through the business administration and had a kid and then had another kid and then got halfway through early childhood development and pandemic. So mm. I couldn't do my internship or any of that. But yeah, I am just a regular person, which is part of the reason that I think it's important um, for me to be as loud as possible is because there are a lot of people who look at some of this work. They look at getting your community together around an issue and they think that you have to have some special ability, some special knowledge. You really do not. You just have to be willing to show up. That's it. Just show up. And the best people to make change in their own communities are usually the ones who don't have like that outside looking in, like, uh, I have a degree and I know best, like the way that I put it is like, you live it, you lead it. Like that is the best experience that you can have. Like if you have suffered from, uh, addiction, like you should be the one to lead like advocacy around, uh, treatment and recovery and harm reduction. And like, if you've lived, 
uh, being poor and rural, like wherever, then you should be the one to lead like the uprising for the, those communities. And um, yeah, 100%. I love that so much. And you, so as a normal person, you've amassed like, thir- last time I checked, it was like 13,000 some followers and maybe more than that now. But how did the, like you gather this TikTok following? Like, how have you... I don't know. (laughs) I have no, I have no, I just, I just talked. And I think part of it, um, and it would be silly not to acknowledge this part of it is novelty. Um, People see someone from an area with an accent that they don't expect talking about leftist issues. And it's just, it's a novelty for them. Um, And for some of those people who openly admitted, like, this is kind of crazy. I didn't know there was any of, you know, leftists in that area whatever um and it has turned into a lot of really cool mutually beneficial relationships where they're like you know I've never thought about that before I'm really glad you said something and the other way around too because my view is very limited I've only lived here um so I don't know what it looks like outside of here um so learning from each other has been supreme yeah And so since you've like lived there your whole life, I mean, I think the whole point of this podcast is to like shed light on the truth of our communities and like the real authentic values and what the people are like, but also like, um, just, you know, how we view our own communities, why we choose to stay that kind of thing. So I would love to just know like more about your upbringing as an Appalachian, like, how especially like did you were you always like a leftist or did you kind of like stumble into this perspective in the world I know like Virginia and West Virginia in particular because of the labor history it's like I feel like there's more um outspoken uh kind of like populist leftism than there is maybe in like my area where we don't actually have like the coal industry in western North Carolina because it's more of like tourism and blah 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 um so I think here it's like more openly conservative but I would just love to know like yeah what was your upbringing like how did you get to this place where you like clearly identified as a leftist in Appalachia so my upbringing now as an adult like I can look and see how um, things were said to me that would be considered political, but there wasn't a lot of discussion of national or local politics. I, I don't have strong memories of my parents talking about presidential elections and that kind of thing until I was probably in high school. Um, and then my, one of my parents took a pretty hard right turn. We were always conservative, like, but it wasn't really talked about. Like, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that. Um, And then I had a parent go down the rabbit hole, um, probably followed by the other parent, but they they don't discuss it very much. Um, And that was uncomfortable and gave me pause, you know, because I was I was nearly grown when that happened. Um, And I have not been what would be considered a leftist by anybody until the past few years, probably three years, maybe. Um, I was kind of taking that left turn six months to a year before I got on TikTok. Um, and it was slow going. And then of course, pandemic and the murder of George Floyd and, and a lot of other things just kind of busted it wide open. Um, and now look at me. Now look at you. You're spreading the good word all over the internet. Um, wow. So that's like super, I mean, that's, basically around the time of just before the like Trump ran for re-election like what so was that really like part of what propelled you towards the left was like all of just that happening and and before that <clears throat> just out of curiosity and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to but like had you even like voted in elections or like paid attention before that I probably didn't start voting until my early 20s um and I'm I'm 36 now um So I started voting in my early 20s, but I wasn't like I thought it was important to go vote. Right. That's our civic duty. Everybody should go vote. Doesn't matter who you vote for. Um, And really, by the time uh, Trump came on the scene, I had already gone from considering myself a Republican to casting about for something else um, because I knew (laughs) I knew that I knew the Democratic Party platform because I had been arguing against it for all this time I considered myself conservative Uh, and then (laughs) 
I just couldn't do it anymore. Like I had kind of already just sort of disengaged from any sort of Republican politics. And then uh, Trump came on the scene. And at that point, I considered myself a libertarian because I didn't, I wasn't even aware that there were options outside of that, you know, like reasonable options because I had the same commie fear, right? Like it is drilled into everybody in the US. I think, I don't think this is specifically Appalachian, but communism, socialism, those are all scary. Those people want to kill you. They want to take everything you have, leave you with nothing. Um, but you know, libertarianism wasn't kind of either, right? <laughs> like it was missing out on these social things that I had come to care very much about. You know, there was nothing in the libertarian ideology that said, this is how we feed our poor people. Um, this is how we house our poor people. Because there are very clearly poor people who can't do better. They are disabled. Um, they have this generational trauma, which we know what poverty and trauma does to the brain, especially in those little baby brains at a young age. Like, how can you overcome that with someone just saying, well, here's a better job you can work. That doesn't solve any problems. And yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, so first when you're talking about like the fear of communism, I'm excited for you to hear the first episode that we drop <clears throat> on June 14th, the first one is all about like the history of the term redneck and like why we chose that for this podcast. And, you know, the meaning of redneck has changed throughout history, but it's been pretty synonymous with like reactionary, poor white folks. And at one point, specifically when the labor union started to reclaim the term during the Battle of Blair Mountain, like all of that uprising period, uh, they were reclaiming the term redneck on purpose to bring together, I'm sure I don't even have to explain this to you, like uh, the folks from like immigrant communities that didn't even speak English. And then of course, like the poor white folks who were naturalized citizens and they would all tie on that bandana and they would like be unified. It didn't matter where they came from. And in order to combat this like re reclamation of the term redneck, what the mainstream media and like politics and people in power started to associate redneck with at that point was literally communism. Like they would, they simultaneously tried to make people believe that these were uneducated, stupid white people. And at the same time that they were like foreign spies who were here to just like blow up America. And it's just so like that fear of communism, especially in our communities, it makes so much sense because that has literally been used against us before when we've tried to come against the state. Um, but yeah, also just like the recognition of, I think so many in our communities, I don't know, like if you, uh, sounds like, uh, you grew up with pretty conservative parents and, um, but I feel like even when we, at least in my experience, I was raised by like a multitude of folks because my mom was a single mom. And while they would all like self-identify as conservative, like the way that they acted was not conservative. Like, <laughs> like right? one of my cousins would be homeless and struggling with addiction to opiates. And like my grandma would like let them sleep on the couch, like would never kick them out and be like, well, fend for yourself, you know? And then like, I had church members who would watch me, like literally give me a bedroom in their house, even though my mom was like a 19 year old single mom, like they didn't ever say, oh no, we're not going to feed you. Oh no, you can't stay here. And like, ultimately, and I don't know if you feel this way, but like, I think that's why I'm leftist is because I was raised in Appalachia where people all, they will take care of you. They may say shitty things, but I don't actually think that that's how they feel inside. Like they actually care about people and would give you the shirt off of their back, like 99% of the time. Yeah, I, that huge, huge agree, because I think a lot of like the shitty things that they do say, those are more directed at themselves, because that's what they think, that's what they think, if you are on drugs, it is because if I, they're thinking about it about themselves. Like if I were on drugs, it would be because I had given up on my family and like, I would be making a conscious choice, but they allow room for people who are struggling with addiction. They, they allow room to say, yeah, but I know, I know Steve, Steve had a hard upbringing. Like his mom and daddy weren't ever there for him. He had a hard time. He got hooked on this stuff. He's trying to do better. Like they can see it in other people. They give other people the grace that they don't give themselves. 
which I think is a lot where that comes from. Oh, that's so true. And like to put a word on that, it's like shame. And like shame is one of the most powerful emotions. If there's anything that Appalachia has experienced externally to like shut us down, it's like shame, 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 shame on you for being racist, shame on you for being white trash, shame on you for being moonshiners, shame on you for like being outlaws, vigilantes, like whatever the shit, like shame, shame, shame. And that's so on purpose because, and I don't know if you've listened to Brene Brown, but she's a social worker who talks about the power of shame and how like we will act. It's a form of trauma, like shame in itself is a form of trauma. We will act totally unlike the person that we want to be because we feel so much shame towards ourselves and like who we think we need to be. Yeah, there's a, I think growing up hard because in like my family, we always had food and we always had somewhere to live. Um, but a lot of that food came from out of our yard or out of the woods, or we, you know, raised and slaughtered our own hogs and that kind of thing. Like we made the food happen or the, a lot of the food probably wouldn't have happened. Um, and I think, I think live in a life where it's hard, live in a life where things are precarious, where if you personally make a bad choice, even if it's you couldn't have told it was a bad choice. It can have long lasting consequences. And I think that gets ingrained in us. I have to be perfect. I have to do the right thing. I have to make the right choice because if not, my babies will be hungry. Um, and that's, that's a really hard thing to live with. And I think a lot of people in this area do live with it. Yeah. And truly on like the, on the precipice, like triggers that fight or flight, right? It's like, I've got to fight for my family or I've got to flee. And I think that's also something we see in Appalachia. It's like people either do fight and they get painted as these reactionaries because they're doing their best to fight for their families or they leave Appalachia behind because they don't feel like they have another choice if they actually want to do good for themselves. Um, so that's so true. So, okay. So you like three years ago were really like, recognizing that you were identifying as a leftist and when did the like the mutual aid free store shenanigans come into the picture so that is actually fairly recently we did not officially open the free store until last august so it has not been around that long really what it started with was um for me kind of my the the real beginning of my seeking something different politically and getting involved in my community was the campaign. There was a campaign here for a new middle school. Um, We had two middle schools that were in hideous condition. I will send you pictures because it is just a sight to behold. Um, They had exterior walls held up with steel beams like on the outside because the walls were pulling away from the buildings. Um, There were limited bathrooms uh, and the ones that were there didn't have stalls, would have, you know, cracked toilet bowls, ceilings falling down. There were rooms in the buildings that even janitorial staff were not allowed in because they were structurally unsound. Like these were showing pictures to people from outside the area. They were like, this looks like the scene of a horror film. And that was where my child was going to school every single day. You know, we had two of them. And so what we did was there was a couple of women who got really fired up and got us all whipped up and we went to the school board and we were like, hey, we want to help you. You know, we're going to meetings. We're telling them we want to we want a new middle school. We want to do something. Um, And that ended up in a battle with the board of supervisors who did not want to fund the middle school. So they thought they would get one over on us by saying, we'll put it on referendum. I'm not going to pass that but we'll put it on referendum. And if you can get the votes come election time, then, you know, so be it. Baby, who got Never the Never hand an Appalachian woman a challenge. Vote. You just don't do that. <laughs> there were so many of us. We were knocking on doors in the trailer court. We were tabling. We were, you know, having fundraisers. We had shirts. We had bumper stickers. Like we went all out and we won the yes vote for that combined middle school in every district in our county oh like, hell yeah you did out. <laughs> i just my favorite thing is when people underestimate appalachian women and then appalachian women are just like oh honey you don't know <laughs> yep and that's it's 
it's wild because the women who were the strongest in that movement, who got a bunch of us fired up, they were women with very different political, you know, feelings. Like it was full spectrum. We had some very conservative people who were leading that. And we had some very, probably not leftist, but they probably wouldn't tell you if they were, you know, gets uncomfortable because they all have grown up jobs, you know? (laughs) Yeah. They have grown folk jobs, so they have to like make people happy. I have no jobs, so I get to say what I want. But, you know, they were more left, like they were solidly Democrats, probably socialists, but don't ask them in front of people. Um, And it didn't matter. We did not care. Like everyone was in this elbow deep and uh, it was amazing. And that's what got me all in the mess. And I haven't gone away since. Oh, I love that. And I have like so many thoughts my head gets spinning and I'm like okay where do I start like first of all like when you're talking about like the state of the schools multiple schools in your area so I just made a video the other day on TikTok where someone was like how hard is it for rural folks to just vote in their best interest and I was like there are so many factors that are literally set against us so that we can't like when we think about the state the reason I thought of this is because public education is part of the reason that people don't have the cognitive thinking and like discernment when propaganda and disinformation is like getting pumped into our communities like they can't discern that from like factual stuff because of the state of public education and like the defunding and stripping our schools of even like quality like physical space is just like part of that very intentional campaign to like keep folks disenfranchised and like uninformed. And I mean, I hate to use the term uneducated, like I don't think uneducated equals dumb, but I think the way that they, it's almost like anti-educate us is what they do through the public education system. Yeah, I can totally agree with we do receive like an anti-education and there are a lot of towns in Appalachia all through from, you know, New York on down that are having the shrinking problem. You know, the population that's there is getting older people who they graduate high school and they don't stay, they dip out, which leaves us with this same group of elders who want what's best for everyone but have not done the work to figure out what would be best for everyone um, and see us disagreeing with their decisions as a challenge. Like that middle school, that's what that was. We were challenging the older male authority and they didn't like that. And we didn't want their compromises. We didn't want to half-ass any of this. Like we wanted a quality school for our kids. Um, And it was what made the most sense financially and every other way. Uh, but we challenged them. And so they thought they would throw it back at us because we would never win. But that's kind of the point is when you spend that much time being in charge of other people, you become disconnected from your community. When you are 60 years old, you are disconnected from what is important to 19 year old people in your community. And if you're not actively seeking out that information, those 19 year olds are just going to leave. They're just going to leave. If they try to say something and you don't listen, they're just going to dip because they can. Um, and that leaves us with the generation of people who don't live near their grandchildren, don't have that community support. I mean, historically, Appalachia, just by how it exists, is socialist, right? We all live in, on the same piece of family land where, you know, Dave grows the potatoes and he does real good with tomatoes. So we got him doing those too. And then, you know, uh, Vicky takes care of the cows because she's got away with them. And then we've got the orchard over here on this part. Like that is the way that it worked. It still works that way a whole lot of the time, but we're losing it because we're losing our next generation. They're dipping out. I've got a kid who's almost 18. Everything that I do, I'm going, can I do enough? Can I do enough to make this the place he wants to stay? Can I do enough so that the schools are good enough that were he to have children, he would want to raise them here? And it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work for everybody. Yeah, it is. I mean, so I'm a, quite a bit younger than you. I'm 28. And um, I distinctly remember wanting to leave like for a long time. I mean, so I, similar to you, like my family did not actively talk about politics. And honestly, where I live, um, 
the local politics are, were for a long time really dominated by the Democratic Party. And so people would register as a Democrat to vote in the primaries and then have a say in local politics. So people who were Trumpers would be registered Democrats in my community. And that was a lot of my family. And, uh, and you know, I, even though like they never talked about politics, I always had these more leftist, just like accepting and openly loving ideals. And, and I was like, I don't fit in here. Like this place is so small. Like I have to get out of here. And then I ended up not leaving for college. We have a, a small university here called Western Carolina University that's tucked into Colby, which is in the town I grew up in. And, um, and so I just went to the local college and it was really through that experience that I like grew to love where I came from because I was able to like step away from the family just enough to like accept my culture and like really lean into it. And then I graduated from college in 2016 and I was still waiting tables and cashiering, which I had been working since I was 15 years old at this point. And people started telling me like, oh, if you want to get out of poverty, like you have to just leave Appalachia. And like that, what they were like, get out of Western North Carolina, go to Durham, go to Greensboro, like wherever the jobs are. And I, it was really at that point that I started realizing that like electoral politics, like I 100% agree with you, like vote, don't sit out because that's what, don't sit the elections out because that's what they ultimately want. And it was at that point that I was like, voting's not enough because my community's getting written off either way, whoever's in office. And like, we've got to stay here and fight with our people and like remind them that they can fight. Cause I think so much of like that shame and like also like our dignity has been erased. Like people often feel like they aren't worth fighting for here in our community. And it's just so heartbreaking because these folks are just so, it is, it is worth fighting for. Like the people, the place, the culture, it is all worth fighting for. And it is a whole lot of work. And I do think that like this, is, they are intentionally stripping us of that like socialist mutual aid, like roots and coexistence that you're talking about because they are, that is self-governance, right? Like if we are self-sufficient, they can't have that. So if Bobby's growing tomatoes and Joe is raising the cows and we're all having a community dinner and everybody's fed and everybody's housed and we don't need the government. That's a threat, like straight up to them. And I had this experience recently. So in August, uh, Haywood County, where I live, there was a part of Haywood County in Crusoe that was just wrecked by tropical storm Fred. I mean, hundreds of people were displaced. There's a Pigeon River that runs right through there. And there was this giant 14 foot swell that came down the river. And like my friend's RV that he was living in, they still haven't even found it. Like it was rough. Um, and in the response to that, I mean, there was no government to be found, right? Like <laughs> for weeks, we're driving around on ATVs, delivering water to the people who are up past the landslides that literally like took out whole houses, just making sure that everybody's taken care of. We're mucking out the house, like feet of mud out of people's trailers. And we got no FEMA assistance. Roy Cooper, our governor is nowhere to be found. Biden is nowhere to be found. And so what we ended up doing is taking over the Crusoe Community Center, which was like leased by a nonprofit and uh, we turned it into basically a free, or at least what I understand a free store to be, where it was like packed floor to ceiling of things, just whatever you could imagine, dehumidifiers to get the water and the moisture out after the flood, shovels and buckets, but also like diapers, formula, clothes for folks, boots, work boots. And then we also, there's an industrial kitchen in this community center. And so three hot meals a day, we had teams just coming in to make three hot meals. And even though folks had like lost everything they were sitting at tables eating their hot food like joking and laughing and getting along because it was like they had each other and they felt more connected than ever and I kid you not zoo one of our local uh state representatives who is extremely alt-right and has a history of recorded violence against women came in to the community center uh, with a preacher who had invited Madison Cawthorn to come give a sermon at his church when we weren't there and it was just our volunteers. I was like helping coordinate volunteers. So the coordinators weren't there. It was just the volunteers. They came into this community center 
and screamed at the people there, this is not a soup kitchen, locked up our dehumidifiers in a closet and kicked us out. And the reason was we were a threat. We were doing all of it without any government assistance and they cannot have that. And it wasn't the fucking Democrats who came in and shut us down. Talk about small government. <laughs> That makes me so angry, like to kick you out. It's one thing to come and like make their shitty opinion known, like y'all shouldn't be doing this and, you know, bootstraps. I guess y'all were just supposed to. We won't have this communist agenda is what they said. Communist agenda, making sure your constituents that you ain't taking care of get what they need. And that is, it kind of goes back to your point of like anti-education and that kind of thing. They want us busted up. They want our families to move away. They want us to not have deep roots because that's what defeats them every single time is the fact that we are rooted. We know each other. We care about each other. We care about this land, taking care of it, keeping it safe. We, you know, like the only way that they win is when they bust us up. And when you look at the history of the labor movement, I mean, that's obvious. Like when you look into West Virginia and the battle of Blair mountain and all of that, like There are some historians that classify that as the U.S.'s second civil war. I mean, the government bombed the miners. Like, it was a whole thing. Um, But they don't don't want to talk about that because they don't want us to know that we have the ability, we have the power. I mean, that's our Appalachian history. I went to public school. I did never learn about any of that. And I mean, we talk about whitewashed history and whitewashing is almost like power washing. It's not just about like only highlighting white victories, because if that was the case, then we would hear about them. (laughs) Right. It's the right kind of white victory. Exactly. The right kind of white people, the rich white people. Yes. The powerful white people who are deserving of making decisions on behalf of others who aren't capable of making decisions on behalf of themselves and then also the people who are deserving of making money off of our labor our bodies our land like our communities yeah the exploitation is outrageous and you know there's there's a conversation to be had that should be had that should always be had about land back like we are settlers we are oppressors even though we are the poor ones even though you know this for a lot of our ancestors was maybe not the choice that they would make. They maybe came here out of desperation and that kind of thing. We still have to acknowledge that this land we took, uh, whatever part we had in that. But, (laughs) but we're here, we can't help that. And it's still on us to be good stewards of the land, to make sure that our kids can hunt and fish and farm and do all the things that we've always done because they're not going to get to do that. Uh, President Biden has been on a big kick about burn pits. We have open burning. Those burn pits that he talks about that are happening, you know, overseas where U.S. imperialism is wreaking havoc. We burn those same chemicals in open air burns in this country all over. There is one not probably as a crow flies, not two miles from my house. Like we're doing it here within range of, I think, two elementary schools within two miles each like of that open burn site those same military munitions like they are they're poisoning us they're doing everything they can not just to not educate us but to educate us in the wrong direction and bust us up and man they get pissed when it don't work Oh my gosh, they sure do show their asses when it doesn't, when it don't, like when they just don't get their way. And I try to point this out to like wealthy white liberals in particular who love to like scapegoat rural America. I'm like, what you are doing is contributing to the exact shit that you're claiming to stand against because like, especially when they're like, well, they just need to do better. Like I'm just morally superior to, to these people. Clearly it's a moral failing. It's like, We've got this public education that you're describing, like the situation of just, uh, we'll call it public diseducation. Uh, and then we've got what you were t- like the poisoning us. We know that lead poisoning 
and this other shit like literally makes you fucking psycho. <laughs> it literally makes you crazy. And they're doing it to our communities. And then on top of that, we know that traumatized brains also cannot make rational. They can, but it's not easy to make rational logic based decisions when your brain is traumatized and they're also doing that to us by keeping us in this state of like fight or flight constantly i was um talking to i was interviewing uh some friends of mine from fire on the mountain podcast earlier today actually and telling them in 2017 i was doing a listening survey in my community where it was just like asking folks going door to door talking to everybody that i could get to and asking them like what do you actually struggle with on a regular basis like what do you actually think would be a solution and change that? And then who do you actually think is responsible for bringing the solution to life? And like, I were the two thirds of everybody that we talked to said, healthcare for everybody is exactly what we need. So it's not like our community doesn't know that these are the things that we need. It's that we've got Sinclair media pumping fucking propaganda into it. We've got our schools not being funded. We've got our water and our air being actively poisoned. And then all we can think is to like regurgitate this Fox news, like horse shit because we don't have the capacity for anything else. Well, and we've been told Appalachians, generally speaking, we distrust ourselves because we're told even by our own, like I have memories as a kid of, you know, my parents, my grandparents saying, you know, don't talk like that. You'll never get a job. Don't ain't wear that. Ain't, out. Word. <laughs> yeah. ain't nobody going to give you a job. If you sound like that, ain't, ain't a word and you ain't going to use it. Yeah. Oh, don't wear that out. Young and people, you look like you belong in the hay field. Well, mm-hmm. but I do that's where you brought me up. And so I think a lot of Appalachians have this shared experience of like this period of self-loathing, which maybe is too strong, but of attempting to disconnect ourselves from Appalachia, from our roots, from our accent and our, our traditions and all of that, because that's not how you do it in civilized society, right? Fuck that. I'm so angry for that time that I lost from listening to that show, which, you know, I was a child and whatever, but like, it's taken me well into adulthood to be like, yeah, fuck yeah. Like, this is always who I've been and why should I be something else? That's dumb. It's that like proximity to the right kind of white like you were talking about earlier. It's like, we gotta be close to the upper class white folks. And I lost a lot of my accent and I get really sad about it to this day. It's like, cause my grandma, did that she trained my accent out of me she was like no you have to sound she would say you have to sound smart like that's the way that she would phrase it and it's like now people my neighbors will be like where are you from you don't sound like you're from around here and I'm like but I am <laughs> I'm one of you. Exactly. Well, and that's for a lot of us you know there are and there are lots of situations where you can and should in different ways code switch like it, it, it's it's a thing that makes sense it's a useful life tool however being taught to completely disregard disregard the way you were taught to speak and and the way that you know the people around you the people most important to you in your life speak it cuts off a piece of you you lose that which in turn makes it easier to leave which busts up all of the family support and the you know non-government controlling of your area because that's what capitalism wants they want us you know the the capitalists the the owner class they want us as separate from people who will care for us as possible that's exactly right and like you were saying oh that's my baby monitor um telling me it's gonna (laughs) die which is fine because he's in there um yeah, like you were saying earlier, like by no means, I mean, we are still a part of like the oppressor class. Like we came here during colonization, like we can't deny that. And I don't want what I'm about to say to be interpreted as me trying to compare the plight of Appalachians to the plight of people of color by any means. But what I'm trying to say is that people in power under white supremacist capitalism have done this to multiple cultures of which Appalachians are only one. Like I live right on, I mean, Cherokee, um, the tribal, the Eastern Man of Cherokee Indians reservation is in, I grew up in Jackson County, which was unfortunately fucking named for Andrew Jackson and the yeah. reservation, the Kuala boundary is literally right there. And, um, 
And they've done that to the Cherokee folks. Like I have friends who are of Cherokee descent who like they are actively trying to save the Cherokee language, which, you know, Appalachians, we did at one point probably have like what would consider to be like part a separate English language, which they have intentionally ridden us of. But like they've done that to culture after culture because the more we identify with the systems in place, the more we'll fight for those systems instead of for our people and for our culture and for each other. Yeah, and that it's it's the removal of identity, which is the same thing that gives whiteness its power. It's removing of your individual identity, of your cultural identity, of you know, the traditions of your people, whether your people are from the holler or you know, wherever. They they want to strip that from us. And they've been very successful at it, like very successful in Appalachia. And even as you know, people try to come out of we want to learn new things we want to meet new people we want to expand our worldview and even then as a leftist I come across so many people and I'm begging anyone who might be listening who feels that they are a democrat or whatever please never ever ever say that we need to stop voting against our own interests because darling you don't know what our interests are. You don't know how those good, those policies you see as very, very good can absolutely crush us. And yeah, it's it. not just about us. Like there could be a greater good, but if you don't allow for the fact that green policies are the worst, are the worst, we want to preserve our land. But if you put a big honk and gas tax on there, when people have to drive 30 minutes or more just to go to the grocery store, like, fuck you very much we can't do that it is unmanageable yeah policies like that only work in communities where they have access to things like public transportation and (laughs) sidewalks (laughs) and that's what so much of the green policy that comes from like the democratic party they're missing that portion they want to say all right we need less gas consumption so we're going to add this gas tax or and I'm so sorry to anybody who's listened to this, who's heard me a million We're going to make times. a lot of people angry with this podcast. So it's, we've accepted it. Well, and I'm just, I'm going to like hit, you know, one of my greatest hits here. Fucking cash for clunkers was a garbage program. Cash for clunkers killed the used car industry, which was how poor Appalachians had a vehicle to get to work. It's how we had a vehicle to do anything because here you have to have a vehicle. You can't hoof it anywhere maybe your neighbor's house like there's no oh I'll run downtown and get my groceries and take the butt like you have to have a car and so wealthy you know middle class people they didn't have any problem turning in their old car that I could have bought for two grand out of their yard (laughs) they turned that in got their credit bought their new forty thousand dollar car and their life was great we got screwed yep yep and a lot of communities of color have been screwed by similar so-called yep. liberal policies. And I mean, we even think about NAFTA, which was like praised by progressives and liberals. And it's like, that is, that destroyed rural Appalachia. I mean, and a lot of rural America, I'm sure like the Dust Bowl area, like all of that. We have, it's the most like poignant example of this that I can think of where there used to be an old deco plant and by no means our industrial jobs, great jobs. We still dealt with a lot of shit, but so this deco plant used to make machine parts and it was a decent job with salary and benefits. And now where the old deco plant used to sit, there's a Walmart. (laughs) And like that really paints a picture of like what happened to our communities because of NAFTA. Like people that work at that Walmart get paid $8 an hour and no benefits. And that Walmart hires more people than the old deco plant used to hire for salary and benefits. And it's literally on deco road. (laughs) Like it's not, Mm -hmm. and that's what people think that we're like, poor rural communities are just like, oh, they just hate immigrants and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, like the elite and powerful have intentionally pitted poor white folks against communities of color and communities abroad and like immigrants through these policies. And like anytime they need to union bust, et cetera, they would literally let open up the borders and be like, come on in take these jobs because the white folks are striking and we don't want to pay them more. And like, it's all so intentional. And I don't know 
that's probably something that I spend a lot of time talking to people about in real life. I don't talk a lot about um, racism and that kind of thing on TikTok because I want to continue to enjoy the platform. Uh, And like, I can't, I cannot deal with foolishness coming from every direction, right? But that's something I try to get across to people in, in like my day to day is we make these caveats of, you know, we're, we're trying to protect our land and keep our water healthy, but we acknowledge, you know, that indigenous people have been trying to do that before. And we talk about code switching or how different policies impact poor rural people, specifically poor rural Appalachians. Um, but we know they also impact communities of color. And like, that's the thing, that's the thread. If we could all, and I'm talking to the white people, if we could all look at our indigenous friends and neighbors, at our black friends and neighbors, at you know other people of color, your friends and neighbors in your community, if you could look at them and say what they care about, I'm going to fight for. I'm going to stand beside them and I'm going to fight with them. I'm going to stand beside them. I'm going to do what they ask of me to help with their thing. If we could build those movements, if we could get our heads out of our asses, stop trying to be the most important person in the room, acknowledge internally, not externally, internally acknowledge your whiteness and how that could possibly impact your view and what you do and make those real connections, we will be fucking unstoppable. Like that's, that's the work that I see right now. Like the big umbrella, like that's the work we have to do. So we have to acknowledge to ourselves, we are oppressors, even if it wasn't our choice. I mean, obviously I was fucking born here. <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't hop on a boat. Like I didn't come kick anybody off the land, but that doesn't matter. I'm the descendant of people who did for whatever reason, desperation or otherwise, even if you colonize out of desperation, you're still a colonizer. If we can acknowledge that and build those real connections and be the kind of people that people of color can trust, which is going to take a long time. Uh, but if we can do that, we're fucking unstoppable. We win this shit. Done. Which is the why people. they've worked so hard to make it. So- <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I totally, I appreciate like the way that you phrase that as far as like you try to get that through to people in your everyday life, not necessarily on social media, because I feel like my TikTok, what it's turned into, which I've got a fraction of the following that you've got at this point, but is actually more of like raising awareness towards like the authentic good values of poor rural folks so that like wealthier or more middle-class white liberals who live in these urban areas will stop like using or like repeating these narratives that are ultimately like keeping our people stuck in this framework of like, I'm the, I don't have white privilege. Like they all think I'm a piece of shit, like blah, blah, blah. So I've been like, my TikTok platform is more directed at like the wealthier liberals who scapegoat our communities. But similar to what you're saying, like, I do feel like in my everyday life, as someone who is here with like roots here that knows how to speak the language of the people without making their defenses go up first things mm-hmm. like, my job here is to break through that trauma response so that they can like come to the other side of this cognitive dissonance and start to see the connections that they have with these communities of color so that we can start to rebuild this multiracial like working class solidarity because that is ultimately what we need. I mean, when I think about like Martin Luther King Jr.'s poor people campaign when they like marched on Washington he intentionally brought in like poor Appalachians and poor white folks from Mississippi because he knew that those were the folks alongside of the black and brown folks like that we needed all of us in order to overcome the powerful because like the ultimate tool that the powerful have is this division to keep us from seeing ourselves in each other and seeing our liberation as like tied to each other's liberation. And so, yeah, I really appreciate just the way that you said that, because I think I feel that really deeply. And I hope that like other Appalachian leftists, like, I know it's hard (laughs) to, to speak your truth to the people that you do love, but that who cause a lot of pain to maybe you directly and like the people that you care about outside of this community. And it's really hard to confront that. And like, also nothing worth doing has ever been easy and and like people of color 
don't get to choose to step out of that. Right. And so like right. we, by choosing to not do the hard thing, like that is using our privilege. And so I think by doing that in your everyday life, like that is the best way that you can leverage the privilege that you do have. And like the, the similarities that you have with the folks in your community. Yeah. And that establishing like these are the ways we are similar because we're all similar in some ways. So even, you know, old Johnny down the road who has questionable taste in flags and whatever else. Now it is not a person of color's job to convince Johnny not to be a racist dickhead. It's my job. It's my job to sit down with Johnny as uncomfortable as it sometimes can be and say, that flag doesn't work for me. Like it's your property and you can do what you want, but that flag doesn't work for me, which, and a lot of these conversations have a predictable pattern. I say, ooh, flag. Johnny says, well, that's my heritage. Okay, well, can you tell me more about that? And it's not being like asking questions so I can get you, which is fun. And you got to catch yourself because, you know, I know more than you, Johnny, but it's not having those conversations with the purpose of catching someone out. It's having those conversations so that Johnny thinks, and for the whole conversation, he might be like, no, nah, fuck you. I like my flag. You're wrong. You're one of them woke commies, whatever. Johnny's going to think about it. If you invite him to explore his own damn thoughts, he's going to think about it. And it might need to marinate for a day or six months or whatever. But every one of those little seeds planted goes toward the harvest of Johnny pulling his head out of his ass. So every time you have a conversation, planting little things, which is a lot of what we've done with mutual aid, is having tiny conversations, planting little seeds, and then letting it go from there. You'll have a harvest. You just got to do the work. Yeah, you don't get abundance from the crops overnight. Like it's a whole couple of seasons of putting in the work before you get to reap the benefits. You <laughs> drink out of your clothes, drink. <laughs> um, no, and I totally, I call that like what you were doing with Johnny. Like I call that compassionate curiosity. We're actually, you do want to know why Johnny feels so attached to this flag as a symbol of his heritage. Like, and that's the same thing I, I use, and um, it's funny because you're, you're like, I don't have a higher education, but like I went to school for social work eventually when I went to the university and like that is a social work skill. Like you didn't even have to go to school for that because your empathy and just like watching and connecting the dots between like how people react to different approaches like has allowed you to like figure out how to do this. But similarly, like when I was doing that community listening survey in 2017, I shared a little bit of this story earlier. So sorry for the listeners who feel this is repetitive, but you haven't heard it before. So um, one of the guys I ran into here in Canton, so Canton is a mill town. We have a huge paper mill in the middle of town and uh, it's like the largest employer in town. It's a unionized paper mill. And uh, as I was knocking on doors, it was like shortly after five o'clock, I came across this guy who had just gotten off work and was like stereotypical Appalachian dude, right? Like long white beard, still had his work boots on, but he was propped up in a lawn chair with a Budweiser because he had just gotten off and like, he was chilling. And I strolled up and I'm like, hey, can I talk to you? And he's like, sure, you want a beer, you know? And we start talking and like, I'm asking him, yeah, what you deal with on a regular basis? Like what keeps you awake at night? What are the real issues that you care about? And he's telling me everything that I would say. <laughs> like, he's like, well, wages are so damn low that I'm raising my grandkids because my daughter's a single mom working at McDonald's and she doesn't get paid enough to pay for childcare, which impacts me. He's like, I'm a member of the union, but the damn unions have lost all their power because we're a right to work state now. And I've watched them get busted over the last three decades that I've worked at the mill in that same period of time, the mill that used to be locally owned has now been sold off four different times and is owned by some person down in New Zealand. We don't even know who the owner is. And like all of this, I'm like, yes, he gets it. We're the same. And then we start talking about the opioid crisis. And that is where the Sinclair media talking points <laughs> start coming out of his mouth and how it's all because of the border 
right? Like it's all the people coming over the border, pumping these drugs in our communities. And he was real, like, you know how these Appalachian men get there. They start getting angry. I do it too, honestly. And they're just like, they go on their tangents. And so I was like, okay, there's some big feelings coming up right now. I didn't say that out loud because I, you know, wouldn't want to be just condescending. But when he, like, after he went off for a little, I was like, man, I can tell you're real angry about this and fired up. And I totally get it. Cause I also, like, I have literally lost family to this crisis. They have died. And I'm also real angry about this. And it sounds like you might have some personal like experience with this based on how you're reacting. Like, is there a story that you wouldn't mind sharing with me? And again, not in like a wanting to get him or catch him, but like a compassionate curiosity, where is this coming from? You know, like in your body. And he eventually told me that he had had a friend who had had a knee surgery and had been prescribed three different kinds of painkillers after that knee surgery. And nobody ever told his friend that he might get addicted or that he might want to consider other options to these like heavy duty narcotics. So his friend ends up getting hooked doctor shops so he can keep getting prescriptions. Once he can't get prescriptions from the healthcare industry anymore, he turns to street drugs and eventually ends up on the streets, loses his home, loses his family, loses everything. And this man, I mean, his friend was still alive, but he hadn't heard from him in years. And for all intents and purposes, he was dead, right? And so this man was grieving the loss of his friend. And that is righteous grief. That is valid anger. And had I shut down that man and been like, you're a racist piece of shit because you're talking about immigration as the source of this, like, I'm done with you. Like, where would we have gone? Nowhere. But instead, at the end of his story, I was like, holy shit, I am so sorry. That is tragic and so shitty. And it makes me so angry thinking about how many opportunities the doctors and other people had to warn your friend and prevent this and that I didn't even mention big pharma but that man then said well why would they when big pharma is making bucks off of pumping our community school and it was like all he needed was to hear that yes that should have never happened and then he had the space to talk himself into the right solution. I didn't need to give him facts and figures and tell him he was wrong and blah, blah, blah. He'd heard all that before. He needed to hear that he was right in his feelings, that he wasn't a bad person. Yeah, that like, we all need that. And I think that when you start to look at, I'm a chronic overthinker. I don't know if you had picked up on that. Um, But a lot of what I know about other people I have found out because at some point in my life, I looked at myself and went, well, this is a little fucked up and, and became very motivated to figure out why do I do this? And I also didn't understand people around me in my life. So I want to know why they do what they do. And so it became a lot of observation, a lot of looking, a lot of going, okay, well, I want to change this person's mind. So what did it look like? when I changed my mind, because I used to hold the same view as they did. So what changed my mind? Um, And it all comes down to giving people the space to say the shitty thing out loud, because when it's someone who, and that's everybody, you know, the boogeyman is the woke mob and, you know, they're going to police your language and that kind of thing. And people do get hung up on that. If you're talking to someone during a community survey and they're talking about their loved one who they have lost essentially to opioids and they call them you know they turn into a damn crackhead they turn into a damn junkie now that's not the terminology i would use but it doesn't help anyone for me to be like actually can you say person with a use disorder because it makes me more comfortable like i mean yeah but shove it like can we can we get to that later because we would and place. That. <laughs> yes time and place like it's okay and eventually they're going to want to know those things. Like they're going to say, Ooh, I say this all the time. Is that racist? Like, or is that like, is that classist? Should I not say this anymore? Or once they've come to a point where you have a relationship and it may not be you, it could be someone else. And they'll say, Hey, I know you have become really passionate about uh, helping people with use disorders and making sure there's harm reduction in your community. Can I suggest that maybe you don't say crackhead all the time? Like even when you're joking, cause you know, people like to throw it like as a joke, 
which is insensitive and all of that, but they don't know that. Or some of them have been had, you know, they've got use disorders, they're recovering addicts and they call themselves a crack at, like, it's a funny joke, which if anybody can do it, I guess they can, but they may not even have the capacity to give a shit about your language policing and all of that. Sit in your discomfort and let them have their moment. It's not about you and how those words make you uncomfortable. Just vibe. (laughs) Yes, which is why it's our job and not the people who are like directly impacted by the comments that are being made by these communities. It's like, I'm the one who needs to sit there and be uncomfortable in that space so that I can move my people through this. Um, I think the quote is like, get your cousins. <laughs> You're trying to get my cousins, right? <laughs> Go get job. your cousins. Exactly. They're acting yeah. dumb out yeah. in public in yeah. front of God and everybody. <laughs> oh, in front of God and everybody. God and everybody. Oh. Yeah. And that's, we got to get our people. We got to, that's, that's our job to sit there and listen to them say shitty things, even the, you know, especially when you know they're a good person, especially when you know that their heart, if they understood the things from a larger perspective, they're going to be horrified at the shit they're saying. Even if it is just what some people would consider small stuff, just not the most correct language. Like, I know I do. I look back and go, ooh, but that was a dumb bitch thing to say and you just said it out loud like instant regret but I can't take it back (laughs) yep yep yeah oh man and I know like I think my social work background helps me do this but I feel like your early education work and background like helps you see things as like especially since I had a toddler I try to see everybody as if they were a toddler right like when a kid says I hate you, mom, because they're like in the middle of this reaction that they're having, like, they're not a bad kid. Like they are not, you know, and if they've learned that they have to scream to like get attention, like that doesn't mean that they are going to be a bad person. It means that they really need attention. They really need someone to sit down with them and help them navigate whatever it is that they are experiencing, which I may not be fully prepared for, but I'll do my best to navigate with them. And like, you know, we are a little bit more advanced than toddlers when we get older, but not that much more that we just have more words. Like that's it. (laughs) So it's the, the two things that I think drive a lot of my interactions, whether it's with kids or with adults and with myself, like y'all be nice to yourselves too, because that shit's really important. We don't do enough of that. But the two things that kind of drive me are understanding and capacity. So if this child is not old enough to understand what they should be doing or what I'm asking them to do, then we're throwing it out. Like there is no punishment for this. There is no, you know, judgment, like get rid of it. They don't, they do not understand. And then after understanding, so they acquire the understanding, do they have the capacity if we're talking about not knocking down someone's tower of blocks, even though it's really tempting, like, how do you stop yourself? They probably can't. Like, do they if, have if, impulse control? Yeah. Do they have impulse control? Do they have the capacity to do the thing that they understand they should be doing? Like, I could tell my five-year-old to load the dishwasher. She has the understanding of what that would look like. She does not have the capacity. She's not tall enough to reach into the sink. You know, she can't reach up onto the high shelf to get the dish soap or any of that. Like the understanding is there, but not the capacity. If the person in front of you doesn't have both the understanding and the capacity, then you cannot, you can do whatever you want, but you should not be a dick to them. They don't have the necessary tools. Because it doesn't do any good to be a dick to them. <laughs> and that's no, it does damage, yeah. I think. Agreed, 100%. Well, I know we're coming up right on an hour. I want to be respectful of your time. And I probably should go check on my kiddo too and just make sure that <laughs> he hasn't gone and wrecked his whole room by now. Um, but before he we would run- never. He's an oh, angel baby. Don't oh, lie. He's an angel baby. And he raises hell just like his mama. So I can't hold it against him. I love it. (laughs) But before we hop, I would actually, like, we didn't get to dig into the the free store a ton, but I would love for you to just, like, share with the listeners what a free store is, what you do at your free store, and how they could support you at your free store. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So the free store. 
um, <laughs> I was lucky enough to know people who knew people and got connected with um, Sabrina, who had moved up here to my county and didn't really know anyone and what she's gonna get mad at me for saying this i'm gonna say anyway she was kind of under the impression that everyone here was just a religious zealot and didn't you know like she didn't have any ends and when she tried to meet people it didn't always go well so we got hooked together um and we would just have conversations like we really only talked to each other through facebook and it would be you know it would be really cool if we, our town had a community center that was free for everybody. Like just a place where you could go and get a shower and, you know, maybe there's food and there's a gym and all of that. Like that would be so great, but wow, how expensive. And we would come up with all these ideas. And the one we kept coming back to is a free store over and over a free store. Um, and so it really just, it became the thing we got stuck on. And one day I got a text message or a, you know, messenger from her that said, I got us a storage unit. We have a free store. Cause we had talked about, you know, could we start this in a storage unit or some non-traditional way? At that point, I was just giving away clothes out of my van, like a crazy person. Like I would go set up in the trailer court and, you know, have like a free yard sale, whatever. Um, and so then we had a storage unit and we opened in the storage unit on August 1st of last year by October, we were in a building. Now, <laughs> to get us into that building, Sabrina and her husband made a enormous financial commitment of a large portion of his retirement. It bought the building. Wow. Yes, they're, they've got skin in the game. They're serious about this. Um, and that's something that the rest of us involved could not provide because... <laughs> Because y'all I, <laughs> I don't have a retirement. What is I don't even own my own home, much less another building. <laughs> so we got the building and it has been amazing to see the community support and to see some of the people who traditionally would not be welcome into spaces like this, like people with active use disorders, um, people uh, with mental health struggles that are living not in a home they don't have access to their medications that kind of thing um grown adults you know living close by with intellectual disabilities and that kind of thing like they all have a place where they can come and belong without anyone you know because a lot of them have case managers or other people in their lives that are looking in on them and making sure they get to doctor's appointments and that kind of thing but outside of that they don't have a lot of association with people who treat them like adults who are not interested in whether or not you had breakfast. Like, I mean, if you're hungry, I'll feed you, but I'm not going to go, what did you have for breakfast? Did you take your pills before and at, or after? Like, we just want to hang out with you. We just want to be your community. Um, and it's kind of taken off. Local colleges have been, you know, they send people over. Um, we do, uh, it is hard for, youth for like middle school age kids who get in trouble in our community it's hard for them to find somewhere where they can go and do their community service hours if they're assigned community service and I was super conflicted about kind of participating with the criminal justice system but when you get a call and I've got a 14 year old who has to get in some hours can she come you know work at the store you can't really say no. And it is one of the best decisions I think we have made for the stores to have those kids who we know that they're safe. Um, one of the very few other options for doing that kind of community service work here is in a church or in the police department itself. Um, so <laughs> we are not affiliated <laughs> with, you know, maybe a religion that goes against the one that they have at home or the criminal justice system that assigned them the hours in the first place. Um, so they get to just come hang out and, and do work. Like they're working, but they're working in a place where they're not judged for what they did. We don't care. Like that's your, but sometimes they don't, I mean, like we know it's told to us when we get them like in, we're not going to tell anybody if I'm not the one that is their site manager, I don't know what they did. I'm probably not going to ask because it's irrelevant to what we're doing here. Um, 
And <laughs> we really do uh, try to take in and be a place for the people who don't have another place. I love that. Is there a way that if someone is not in your area, but they want to support the free store that they can do that? So if you go to our TikTok, and I'm literally going to have to pull it up right now because my yeah. memory is garbage. And we'll put uh, it in the show notes once you uh, pull it up and let us know what it is too. Fantastic. So the the TikTok is uh, at free store PC. And then in our bio there, we have a link tree, which doesn't work. Cool. Um, so free it's link tree. PC is one word for TikTok. Yep. Free store PC. Yep. All one word. And then our link tree has our Venmo. It has our website, which is <laughs> how much of this can you cut? Pulaski County free store. We have a Facebook page, which is where we do a lot of communication, like with our community. Cause Facebook's kind of the it's the preferred platform of most people around here. Our website is just Pulaski free store va.org. Okay. Is that P-O-L-A-S-K-I? P-U-L-A-S-K-I. Um, and people are, yeah, okay. Pulaski County or Pulaski free store va.org. Got and it. before anybody asks, it is not the Pulaski where the KKK was started. That's the one in Tennessee. There's a lot of different Pulaskis in this kind of like state block. But here's the cool thing about Count Pulaski. They were likely intersex. After looking at their skeleton, they were likely intersex. Um Wow. Yeah. And that is the count for which your county was named? Mm hmm. Count, first name I can't remember, Casimir Pulaski, was very likely intersex. Um, there was some speculation that they were trans, but I don't think that's accurate. Like, I think it's, it's more this person had physical composition of their bones that both fell into what we consider a male and a female skeleton. Um, so yeah, they likely live their lives as intersex and that is a cool thing. Oh, also we're doing our second pride this year. I really want to pump that just oh my gosh. talking about it. <laughs> our, our tiny town. Um, we had the first one last year, which was just a march around town. Like we really just, and we stayed on the sidewalks because we couldn't afford to pay. You got to pay the police departments overtime if you're like in the road. Um, and we're poor. So, um, I was the grown up. Most of the people that were on the admin team at that point, some of them were still in high school. Um, they wanted to do the thing. And I was like, Fuck, let's the kids do it. are all right. The kids are all right. Like the kids are all right. And there was probably two to 300 people that showed up to this March where we walked on the sidewalks, which is if we had had 50 people, we would have thought it was a huge success like our minds were blown and you could hear people were coming up and telling us like we didn't know there were other people who were gay I didn't know there were other trans people here I didn't like I didn't know any of this um so that was exciting we got our official approval we'll be doing it again this year but we're going to do a little march and then a picnic like a community picnic in the park so that people can actually connect and I'm pumped for that that is so exciting. If I'm remembering correctly, last year was my hometown of Silva, North Carolina's first pride parade too. Hell um, yeah. So we're loving it. And also just like, you know, if any of those kids would like to be interviewed as like queer kids growing up in Appalachia, we can use a pseudonym, like whatever we need to Heck do, but yeah. would love to lift up just their existence and their work. Um, because yeah. that's just amazing. I love Gen Z is, oh, I get chills because they're just killing it they're on it and that like my job as because I'm also I'm just like a mediocre uneducated straight white woman like but I'm doing my job here right like they are doing the thing and I handle the permits and you know do all of the polite emails to the people at the town and like I do the piece that they don't know how to they're not ready to yet or the piece that possibly could hold the whole thing up um because they are 
you know, young queer people living in a county that is not historically been accepting of that. So that's my job is like the, the stepping out in front of them and, and doing the boring work that they're no good at, <laughs> uh, that they haven't learned how to do yet. Um, we'll be working on fundraising calls this week. Cause this is my last year helping to organize. Cause the free store is a lot. It's a lot. And I think at this point, I'm just getting in their way. They'll take off. They don't need me anymore. Well, we all, you know, got to pass the baton at some point. And regardless of what you're doing, like you're going to be doing something amazing. Just, I can tell by the work that you've held down so far and just the love and energy that you shared in our short time together. Um, this probably will not drop until probably like mid July. Cause honestly we've recorded like five episodes and it won't even, that's awesome. I know the first one won't drop until June 14th. But that said, um, those who are listening to this July is not too late to donate mm-hmm. and help support the free store. Um, so yeah, we are 100% community supported. We, uh, get no grants and it, we're working on making that a possibility because, you know, our bills are small, but they're still there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're community funded. We have a free fridge that sits outside 24 seven. Um, so we try to keep food in that. Of course, the community does a lot to stock that. Um, but yeah, I feel like I should have said a lot more about the free store. <laughs> Maybe we can up. have you back. I also have a friend who, um, well, I, someone, I, a new friend who hit me up on the Instagram for the podcast, who helps with the Chattanooga free store. So maybe we can even do like a dual, like, <gasps> yeah. where it's like, we've got free stores from across the region. Like that would be super cool. That would be bad ass. Yeah. So for folks listening, please go check out the free store PC, like personal computer <laughs> on TikTok um, and uh, Pulaski free store VA.org. We'll put those in the show notes so that they're easy to find. Go support this amazing work um, that Zoo and Sabrina and some other of our Southwest Virginia comrades are holding down. And Zoo, thank you so much for taking the time on your Memorial Day to chat with me. I am so glad I got to know you a little bit better and can just tell that this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yes, I love it. Um, I want to talk to you more podcast or not. Yes. Uh, And I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Absolutely.